Welcome to the Bible Made Clear. So last time we left off uh, in 2 Peter 3 verse 10, and we had gone through verses uh, 8 to 10. We talked about how Peter was rebutting the false teachers, uh, and he used scripture, God's nature, which is uh, important because that doesn't change, and then uh, God's promises uh, because they are uh, steadfast and they they always come true right so uh, that also talks to both God's nature and character now in verse 11 which we'll pick up today um, <clears throat> he starts out with the word therefore and therefore is um, really the change to application uh, in other words, in light of the truth that Peter has now shared, um, therefore, in other words, this is how we need to um, apply what we've learned, right? So verse 11 says, uh, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Um Verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, he lays on that, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, in verse 11, the therefore, um, because that starts the application portion of the letter, um, that's the same method Paul used. Paul would go through his letters and then he'd get to the uh, place after he informed us about what we needed to know. Then he'd say, therefore. Uh, that's how you know you're changing from doctrine to application. Um, we get the truth to educate us and then we get the application. Now, that's important because uh, you have to know what, why, um, in, in all, in order to know how. In other words, I can't apply what I don't know. So application is important, but application can only come after understanding. Right? Too many preachers and Bible teachers today, they give an application without interpretation. So if, if I don't understand what the text is, um, and if I don't understand the context, I'll put my own context into it, which is going to be a 21st century context because I don't have another one. And then um, uh, I will most likely not understand exactly what the writer is saying. So Peter and Paul establish for us um, who the readers are in Christ, uh, the benefits and privileges uh, the readers have, and then the interpretation of those benefits so that they can then go on to give the application, right? So application uh, can't be properly known until the interpretation is understood. In other words, what does it mean? Um, and that that's not what does it mean to me. Um, that means what does it mean to the writer, right? Uh, so if you're ever in a Bible study and they go through and they quote some verses, and then, you know, the Bible study leader says, well, what does that mean to you? You know, well, uh, he's asking the wrong question. Um, the, the question isn't, what does it mean to me? The question is, what did the writer mean? So then I can ask the question, how does that apply to me? Much different. So um, it's the interpretation, in other words, what it means that provides the basis of all application. Uh, it's really poor Bible teaching uh, to jump into application before the verses that are under consideration uh, are understood. And it's a common problem in uh, many preachers today. Uh, they like to quote sections of the Old Testament, then right away give application to them uh, in sections that really may have nothing to do with New Testament believers. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't get a lot out of the Old Testament, but we can't apply it directly as, as if we are Jews under the Mosaic Law, because we're not. So 
<clears throat> prosperity preachers are famous for this. Uh, they quote various sections of Moses' law regarding prosperity, uh, promises under the law for uh, blessing and, and um, um, you know, material prosperity. Um, and they also like to get into the areas where they talk about the responsibility of tithing under the Old Testament law. Now, the problem is, is that God certainly does bless. Uh, under the new covenant, there is no guarantee of material prosperity blessing uh, to us. Uh, there, it just doesn't exist. Under the Mosaic law, if you were obedient, you did what you were supposed to, God promised material blessings for the nation. They were national blessings. So if they obeyed his law, if they um, you know, kept his ordinance, his commandments, his statutes, then he would bless them. Uh, he made sure that their crops always had water at the right time, that they didn't get eaten up by bugs. Um, you know, their, their sheep and cattle would multiply and be healthy and all that. And so, and, and even they would be prosperous even within their own families. Um, from a health standpoint, uh, from the uh, position of uh, reproductivity to have large families and all this. So um, <clears throat> so under the law, and you can read this in Deuteronomy 27, 28, you can read the blessings, but they, they're given nationally because there were certainly obedient people under the law that did not have a lot of material blessings. So, but the nation would have them as a whole which would allow for the poorer people to have what they needed. So, uh, but, you know, as opposed to getting into all that, the, the point is, is that um, many times the prosperity preachers, uh, you know, pull up these Old Testament verses and they demand that New Testament believers uh, comply with the verses that they quote or suffer the consequences of judgment um, that are laid out under the law if they don't comply. But the problem is we're not under the law, right? And like I said, those those promises and those judgments were really uh, something that would begin to occur, not just at a personal level, but really nationally. Um, so it's not only irresponsible preaching to do that, uh, but it's very bad Bible exposition or worse. It's just uh, it, it's it's teaching things that are untrue and a misuse of the text. Now, I've heard a lot of the Malachi threats over the years um, on giving. Um, you know, if you don't give, they quote Malachi, you'll be cursed with a curse. But if you do give and you bring it into the storehouse, then God's going to open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing on you. He'll rebuke the devourer, and then you will basically have all the material prosperity and wealth that God promises you. That's kind of their message. But instead of just quoting some of the verse for a fear tactic, let's quote the whole section in Malachi and actually see what the prophet was talking about. That way we can get the context, which we're supposed to, and we can know. So in Malachi 3, verses 6 through 12, uh, God says, For I am Jehovah, I do not change the immutability of God. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Now, they weren't consumed because God didn't change and he kept his, his promises because his nature didn't change, even though their behavior changed. So he promised through Abraham that he would keep them. Anyways, he goes on, Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. They were under the Mosaic law. Return to me and I'll return to you, says Jehovah of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, comes the answer. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Right? Um, so then now he explains what the repentance is. He goes forward and says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that I may... Uh, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, or Jehovah of 
hosts are Jehovah of armies, literally. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy what? The fruit of your ground, nor shall have uh, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says Jehovah of armies, and all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says Jehovah of armies. So that's what he's saying. Now the background, obviously, is Judah had come back um, to the land after their 70-year captivity in Babylon. There were a number of problems that they faced when they came back, uh, with the returning re remnant, you can read about that in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, what they had to deal with. Uh, both Ezra and Nehemiah had to deal with very similar problems, and also Malachi. So one of the problems that they had to deal with was not supporting the Levites in their service uh, in the rebuilt temple. Now, Nehemiah was very strong in his rebuke uh, concerning this in Nehemiah 13, among some other problems that they had. Now, 90 years after Nehemiah, Malachi addresses the same problems. Uh, the people were not tithing uh, the way they were supposed to to support the Levites and the temple. So the result was God was not blessing their crops. In other words, they were breaking the law. So because he wasn't blessing their crops, the nations surrounding Israel were not observing the greatness of God um, and they weren't seeing how God could really bless a nation because Israel wasn't being blessed at that point. Uh, why? Because their disobedience really stemmed from a lousy attitude. It was a sinful attitude. So God said his people are robbing him by not tithing. Now, these are tithes and offerings that were owed to God because of the Mosaic covenant that they were unto, uh, under, and they agreed to that covenant way back in Exodus chapter 19, which you can read. Instead of blessing, <clears throat> Israel was experiencing a, experiencing a curse on their land, um, which was really their economy. Uh, and like I said, you can read the blessings and the curses in Deuteronomy 27-28. So notice in verse 9 of Malachi, God says, this whole nation. He wasn't dealing with them as individuals at this point, though it was individuals that were failing to obey the law. He was dealing with them as a nation. The devourer was the locusts and the canker worms that ate the crops and ruined their harvest, right? <clears throat> it says, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, right? Um, so if they obeyed God and kept their side of the covenant, uh, God would keep his end and bless their crops and they would be prosperous, right? So the result is the surrounding nations then would see what it would be like to be a nation in covenant relationship with God, the true God, uh, and would call Israel blessed and it would be glorifying God. Instead, the nation surrounding Sara sinful people, uh, not a great witness to the Gentile nation. So uh, there's no real direct application here to New Testament believers. Um, and, you know, to tell a New Testament believer to tithe or be cursed um, is really placing them back under the Mosaic law, which they're not under. Now, once we know what this all teaches, uh, we can see that there's certainly a principle that we can use that we can apply to New Testament believers. Absolutely. Um, but taking the principle is not putting the New Testament believer under the Old Testament law. So certainly the first thing that we see is the attitude of the Jews um, that can be applied to us. We certainly should have the right attitude and not see... Um, obeying God is a terrible burden and just not want to do what he asks. Um, we should be obedient people um, to the covenant of grace we're under. Look, there's plenty that the New Testament tells us to do, 
um, as far as you know following commands to be obedient right so uh, and Peter's going to actually give us some here now <clears throat> when we're disobedient as New Testament believers uh, we too misrepresent God right uh, to unbelievers and we we personally miss what God is trying to do through our lives so many times the gospel is ineffective because of how Christians live what they do and unbelievers see them and they're not interested in Jesus anymore now the second principle um, that we can draw as a New Testament believer is about giving to God's work, which continues into the New Testament, however it's under grace. In regard to giving and serving, um, we not only uh, should look at it as it's something I have to do, it's something we get to do. We actually get to serve the living and the true God. And for all that Jesus has done for us, you know, we can offer our lives and our service to him. So this is what we're called to do as part of the body of Christ. So the areas um, that we serve in, uh, all these things that we give in uh, reflect to the world, really, uh, a witness of really who God is in our own lives, right? So if we don't give to God's work, um, it, it's not going to happen on its own. Um, and if we don't serve, uh, many times things just don't get done. So the result is a poor, no pun intended, witness to the uh, community and the world. In Romans 10, 14 and 15, Paul asks a question. Now, this is specifically regarding Israel and the gospel. But again, the application um, and the principle can certainly be drawn with what we're talking about. He says, talking about serving God. How then shall they call upon him who they have not believed? Right? Talking about Israel and their unbelief. And how should they believe on him who they have not heard? In other words, if nobody's actually told them about him. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? So if you got nobody doing it, it's not going to get done. If we got no preachers being sent, then there's no gospel that's going to be presented. So... <clears throat> The point is, is that Christians have a responsibility not only to give to God's work um, in the place where they worship and serve, but also to be involved there, right? So, you know, I always notice you can tell what a person's into during football season uh, by the money that they spend on the clothing to support their football team and the fan toys, right? Um, we put our money uh, where we, you know, um, see value um, you know uh, I like uh, firearms and shooting and you know I can tell guys at the range that really put a lot of money into their uh, shooting skills and those who don't uh, I can also look at people's houses in my neighborhood and I can see those who are spending money or at least time um, keeping up their homes and those that just let them go and <laughs> you know it looks like they're you know, almost condemned houses. So uh, the church is no different. People see um, what God's people put into their church and church life. Um, and, you know, where there's no investment at all. Um, so the work of God is, is manifested and it's easy to see a church where people love the Lord. They're invested in it. They want to serve God um, they support the work and then you know things begin to thrive now um, does that mean that you know if if everybody doesn't kind of do their piece that it won't get done no there are certainly people within the church I mean typically in most churches 20% of the people do 80% of the work that I think it's always been like that however many hands make the work light and it's always a lot better if more people are involved and and quite frankly I don't understand somebody that just goes to church now I, again I understand if somebody is ill or they're physically unable or they're elderly and and they just have things that prevent them from doing things and they can certainly uh, pray and encourage people however uh, to get the actual work done 
Um, th there's plenty of us that are able-bodied people to do it. Uh, I guess the question is whether we're uh, able uh, in our heart, and that's uh, Look, I, I've watched so many Christians put nothing into their Christianity um, over the years, and um, they see their church attendance as kind of meeting the obligation of being a Christian and how wrong they are. Um, now, does this mean that we need to uh, push for money and constantly remind people they'll be cursed if they don't give? No. Uh, we don't we don't need to go down that road and nor is it biblical uh, if you teach through the scriptures you'll come to the places where giving is taught and the people will learn how to give biblically and they'll see it in the context of the text because there are certain places in the new testament where it talks about giving in the 35 years we've been at calvary chapel we've never asked for money for anything and God has faithfully supplied everything we needed. Um, look, people come in, the lights are on, uh, the HVAC works, the building is cleaned, it's, the maintenance is kept, the bathrooms are clean, the utilities are paid, the mortgage is paid, payroll gets paid, ministry costs get paid, all of the stuff gets paid, and um, people can go in, and they do. They come in, they go out without any care. They hear the Word of God. They're encouraged, hopefully, each week. And, um, and many of them serve. Um, <clears throat> but, is the, the giving, but it's the giving by God's people that enables a lot of that work to happen. Uh, God's people have to give and they have to serve. Otherwise, <laughs> there's nobody doing the work behind the scenes. And God moves in the hearts of his people. And they... They give and they serve uh, as they learn the Bible. So the Malachi passage was obviously directed towards the Jews who were not giving or serving or supporting the Levites in their work. The Levites had, they, did, they were not given land to farm. They were supposed to serve in the temple. So if, if people weren't giving, then they had to go find a job, basically. And that's what Nehemiah uh, complained about in Nehemiah 13 and that's what Malachi is dealing with partly here. Now <clears throat> their attitudes were terrible uh, and there resulted in it resulted in their disobedience and that's what was called out by Malachi. So it was a terrible witness inside Israel to the younger Jews and obviously outside Israel to the surrounding nations. Similarly, um, you know we get into the New Testament and, some New Testament believers uh, constantly live carnal lives and negatively affect not only their own family, but also unbelievers that are watching them. Uh, they don't give an unbeliever any indication of the value of being a believer personally or through the work at their church, right? Um, now, should we give and support the Lord's work in the New Testament? Absolutely. Paul specifically gives the principles on New Testament giving in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. But we need to be clear on this. The Old Testament teaches a percentage, um, but there is no percentage that's taught in the New Testament. For example, there's a distinction drawn by Malachi in tithes and offerings where he mentions that. The law defined the first tithe as a tenth. Right of all that was left after the first fruits were paid. So the first fruits were gathered, the very first pieces of the harvest, they were given to the Lord. Then a tenth was paid of the harvest to support the Levites. So this tenth was given directly for that. You can read about it in Leviticus 27, 30 to 33, and Deuteronomy 26, verse 12. Also, a tenth was to be paid to the priests, do, uh, that's in Numbers 18, 26 to 28. So actually the Levites, which was the tribe, would then pay the people doing the priest work within Aaron's family. They would pay them a tenth. Um, there was a second tithe paid by all the Jews um, that was to be paid to the Levites and their families at the temple. Right. That's Deuteronomy 12, 18. And that was 
really to support the temple, the festivals, the feasts, and everything that went on because you had to have something there to do it, okay? And then the third tithe was paid every third year, uh, or some believe, some theologians believe that they, you know, they paid it a third over three years, but, um, you know, 33% and a third every three years. But at least um, every three years they'd pay another tenth and that was given for the welfare of the poor, the widows, the fatherless, and the Levites that were in need because they didn't have an inheritance, right? And they didn't have land to work. And that's in Deuteronomy 14, 28. So, um, so you have a number of these tithes under the Old Testament. So when a lot of these preachers, are, they're, they're just throwing out the tithe and all this stuff. Um, I don't think they really understand many times what they're even talking about. The offerings were in addition to tithes, and these consisted of not less than one sixtieth of somebody's, you know, corn or wine or oil or whatever. And again, Deuteronomy 18, 4 and Numbers 13, 10 to 12 will kind of fill you in on that. So if you estimate everything that somebody was giving, the total tithe amount um, annually looked more like something uh, close to 27% of a person's annual gross. Um, <clears throat> I don't see a lot of people in the New Testament giving 27%, at least today. Uh, so the New Testament, though it doesn't give a percentage, it gives a principle. Percentages are fine if that's how you want to give, but they're not demanded. And um, certainly when we say tithe, which is a tenth, um, it's all, it can almost be a little bit of a, a misnomer as to like how giving is constructed. So Paul loves, lays out an eternal principle for us in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. He says, but I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, open-hearted giving uh, is a sign of love and faith in both the Old Testament and the New Testament for all believers. And Paul says that uh, the love and sincerity of New Testament believers is tested in their giving. He mentions that in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 8. Jesus also talked about giving um, as a simple heart principle. Uh, in Matthew 6.33, says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, if you go read Matthew 6, you'll see the all these things are basically the things that we sink a ton of money into. Um, Jesus also, also talked about storing your treasure in heaven where moth and rust can't take it away. Well, the only way you can get treasure into heaven is... You know, there's no uh, exchange rate where you can put money into the bank and then they transfer it to the heaven bank. The only way you can get money in heaven is by loving and serving the Lord, you know, being involved in his work, furthering his work, um, cooperating with God, finding out what God has called you to do in this life and do it with all your heart. You want to do that and then you leave the results to him. And when you get to heaven, you will be rewarded for all that you did that God called you to do. There's so many people that are doing things God either hasn't called them to do or he's called them to do things that they're avoiding. They're not doing anything at all. So the apostles obviously understood all of this um, and they instructed the church as such, right? Now, the Jerusalem church, as a side note here, was struggling financially and Paul took this opportunity, actually, to take a collection from the wealthier Gentile churches uh, to help them. Uh, now, obviously, the apostles in Jerusalem understood New Testament giving. Uh, many of them gave all that they had, uh, which, again, you know, God didn't tell them to do. Um, but, you know, God didn't prevent them to do it because they did it with a loving heart. Um, but it ended up coming back on them because... Unfortunately, there was a famine in, in and around Jerusalem. So we certainly never want to claim that they were disobedient because uh, they were suffering poverty in Jerusalem. Uh, that would be ridiculous and unsustainable scripturally. But there was a famine. 
that affected the Jerusalem church. As a matter of fact, in Acts 11, uh, 28, it says, Then one of them named Agabus, who stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. So much of the prosperity abuse in Scripture, uh, or, or of Scripture, I should say, by a lot of the prosperity teachers, um, is really just, it's, it's of their own making because um, there are rich and poor people in the Bible, Old and New Testament, and many of the poor people had great faith. Jesus did not grow up wealthy in Nazareth. That's a news flash, right? So I'd recommend reading 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, along with 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, to understand some of the simple principles that Paul laid out for New Testament giving. There is no curse on New Testament believers in regard to giving because they're not under the Mosaic law where the curse is given uh, for being disobedient. And that's not just in giving, but many things. Um, now, there is a lack of blessing that Paul states because if a person will give sparingly, they'll reap sparingly. If you don't want to be involved with God's work, then um, you're not going to experience the work of God through you either. If you avoid God, then uh, you can't really expect that, uh, to be in line with where kind of the river is flowing in a sense. Um, you want to get wet, you got to jump into the water where the river is flowing. Uh, you want to get involved, you got to kind of jump in. <clears throat> you know, it cracks me up. I, every year, you, know, you watch these football games, um, and you get these people all painted up in the in the stands. They they get the they get all the garb on. They get the face paint and all this other stuff to you know support their team and everything. These people are screaming and yelling. You would think that they were part of the team. They're actually not. Now, they're not on the field. They're not actually in the game. They think they are. They feel like they are. They talk like they are. But you know what? They're not. Um, and, and this isn't to downgrade fans of sports teams. That's not the issue. The issue is that there's so many Christians that talk about Christianity. They complain. They go on social media. They slander people. They criticize this. They don't like that, blah, blah, blah. But they don't do anything. They're not in the game. They're like the painted people in the stands. You know, it's kind of crazy. Anyways, returning to Peter's exhortation in verse 11, he says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness, right? Uh, considering everything eventually is going to be burned up, he says, how should we live, right? Uh, how are we going to live? Uh, seeing all these things are going to be dissolved. Well, um, that's why he's kind of, you know, he's brought us back into the application here. We're supposed to live in holy conduct and godliness. To live holy uh, really is to separate from the corruption in the world. Holy, holiness is, is really the word separate. Um, we get the word sanctification from it. You're a saint. If you're a New Testament believer, it means holy ones. It's somebody that God has, because they're his, he has separated them from the world to sanctify them, to bring them away from the corruption to himself. Um, now, that doesn't mean to avoid people. Um, it means to avoid corruption. Uh, we're to live like Jesus, right? Jesus was certainly around sinners, um, but he was not affected by their corruption. Uh, we need to kind of represent him. In other words, we need to contact these unsaved people, but without contamination um, by entering into the corruption that they're in. So sometimes <clears throat> uh, we're at places where sinners are to share the gospel. Um, but many of the times the Lord brings them to us. It can go either way. In other words, um, we need to be cautious in this. I don't need to go to a bar room and sit at a bar in order to share Christ with somebody uh, because they don't live there. Eventually they leave, so I can engage them at other places. Um, and godliness really is God-likeness. Uh, in other words, to live a life properly representing God. I like what the um, Believer's Bible commentary says on this verse. It says, it's 
with godliness, he says, it's a simple matter of living for eternity rather than time, of emphasizing the spiritual rather than the material, of choosing the permanent over the passing. I mean, that really kind of sums it all up. So having an eternal perspective can make all the difference in how we live. So knowing that the Lord can come at any time to take the church, uh, that should be preparing us in our hearts and in our, our living, right? Living as if the world and its system uh, are going to be here forever and we're going to be part of it is going to really dull any spiritual edge that we have. So, look, w we are ambassadors, the Bible says. Paul tells us that in 2 Corinthians 5. We're ambassadors, and so uh, we live in a foreign land that we can be taken back home at any moment. So we're to take advantage of the situation while we're in the foreign land, um, but to also properly represent the country that sent us. So we're an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven, and we should be representing it in that way. Some believers... Uh, they live as though they're going to be here forever, um, and they don't ever uh, seem to anticipate going back to the homeland, if you know what I mean. So, look, we're on a mission in the world, and um, our perspective should not be living like the spiritually dead. We should be prepared and preparing our own families and our congregations. Unfortunately, um, <clears throat> It's much of the carnality in many churches and church people that tend to spread and water down the effects of the spiritual intensity of the church. Um, I like how Peter not only asks the question, what manner of persons ought we to be, but then he answers it and he leaves no room for question by saying in holy conduct and godliness. So um, in verse 12, he says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. So, along with godly living, he adds looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Now, the word hastening is interesting. Um, there's the idea that how believers live can actually somehow contribute to God's prophetic program and speed it up. Now, the timing of God's work is not within our control. Uh, and it's not, it's not left for us to decide. Uh, God has that in his own eternal plan. But um, Paul tells us that <clears throat> God's prophetic focus on Israel will resume after, he says, the fullness of the Gentiles will come in uh, in Romans 11.25. So moving towards the end of all things, basically, we know that the fullness of the Gentiles is going to kind of tie us into this overall end time scenario so when the last gentile comes to christ then the rapture is going to occur and the preaching of the gospel ultimately hastens the coming day of god in other words it's contributing to it in that way there is a prophetic scenario uh, that has to be completed in other words we don't just kind of go like the amillennials our millennialists believe and then just kind of hit a wall and then everything just ends in a second and then we're in eternity. Peter says the day of God <clears throat> and in saying that he's referring to the eternal state since the day of God is the eternal state um, we can get there as we cooperate with God to accomplish his plan. I mean we can be involved in it that's really a neat thing. So first we should be looking for the day to come which means in our hearts that we're set really towards eternal things and not the temporary. Then live a life, which is our contribution, that is hastening uh, the coming of the day of God, right? So maybe we should be asking ourselves if we are looking for the Lord's coming, um, or looking forward more to what this life offers. Uh, I'm not saying that we don't concentrate on our jobs, our careers, our responsibilities that are outside the church. Um, <clears throat> look, I loved the jobs that God gave me. I, I spent 20 years in the high-tech industry before I was full-time in ministry. Uh, I loved working. Uh, I liked working hard. I liked doing a good job. 
I liked learning all the skills that I did. Um, they actually became a tremendous help in ministry today. Uh, I'm thankful that the first 12 years, though I did complain to the Lord about it during that time because I thought I was wasting my time. Um, but I look back and I'm so thankful. The first 12 years I was a pastor, I was working two jobs, right? So I'd work my regular job during the day and everything pastoral had to be done off hours. So it was really a two-job situation. And look, uh, it was demanding. My secular jobs were very demanding. And church work, especially the first 12 years, we, were, you know, we had started a church. There was a ton of work to do. Um, I look back, I was like, I don't know how I survived it. But anyways, <clears throat> working in the world and working in ministry is certainly a challenge. But look, as a younger guy, it was it was very exciting because, you know, when you're younger, you can seem to be able to accomplish more. But um, and it was exciting and it was challenging, but it was great. And uh, and it still is, um, you know, people that are afraid of hard work should never get into the ministry. They ruin it. And look, I, I'll be 67 in a couple of months and um, I, I'm busier now than I was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago so and I thought I was busy then so look serving the Lord can be demanding but it's also rewarding and I serve as I serve the Lord I know that um, I'm doing my part to hastening however I'm contributing that as long as I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do I know that I'm being obedient to his call on my life and it's contributing toward um the Lord's coming, however that's going to work into it with my peace by serving and looking forward to the catching up of the church. But I also realize uh, I'm in a foreign land and I represent a kingdom that is not of this world. So <clears throat> I'll work hard to represent God's kingdom, but I'm always also looking forward to when he calls me home. So some Christians... Um, you know, they've kind of gone onto this ambassadorship into another country and decided they want to live in the foreign country. And, you know, they've become too comfortable and don't want to go home. So um, that's not the goal of an ambassador. Ambassadors are temporary. So the day of God follows the final phase of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, remember, is the tribulation period into the millennial reign and then a new heavens and a new earth. Right. Um, <clears throat> because the present one will be destroyed. The flood destroyed the earth initially. Uh, this final judgment will destroy both earth and the heavens. So scoffers are in for a surprise. They're going to mock the coming of Christ, um, and they're going to live in the world as though he's not going to come, but then he's going to show up. So there will be a complete destruction by fire, compared with the partial judgment of the flood. This is the end of the present order, really, the <clears throat> making of the new heavens and the new earth. Now, Isaiah talked about it in Isaiah 65, 17. He said, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. And then a few verses later in Isaiah 66, 22, he says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain uh, shall remain before me says Jehovah so shall your descendants and your name remain because this enters into eternity and then John saw this in Revelation Revelation 21 1 he says now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first uh, heaven and the first earth had passed away also there was no more sea now <clears throat> are we looking forward to that um or are we tied too much to what this world has to offer? That's the real question for us personally. Um, so many Christians are living their lives in the world. Um, it, at this point in time, right? Uh, and they're under terrible persecution. Um, they don't have the option, really, of enjoying their ambassadorship, if you know what I mean. So... If you go around the world, um, like it's different than here in the U.S. Um, here in the U.S., at least for now, we have the option to make life 
um, enjoyable living it um, and we can take advantage of the present situation but um, God is going to bring in ultimately a new heavens and a new earth and the people that are being the Christians that are being persecuted around the rest of the world um, this is a hope for them because they're living in a misery uh, they're living under the burden of wicked and oppressive ruler in these third world countries with broken governments. As a matter of fact, there was a report um, in the 2024 gender report that's compiled by Open Doors. Open Doors is a, really a, um, it's a kind of a missionary um, and a watchdog um, for global persecution of Christians. But anyways, their global research team draws attention to the marginalization of Christian women um, who live in countries ranked as the 50 most dangerous for Christian persecution. The report highlights the oppression and violence they endure due to their gender and their faith in Christ, noting that forced marriage is a threat to Christian women and girls in an astounding 84% of the countries on the 2024 Open Doors World Watch List. So these forced marriages are mainly Islamic areas, but th th I mean, this is awful. Um, th these poor, not just um, ladies, there's, um, you know, there's obviously men and and, and other children that are persecuted. But, you know, this is one uh, example of how terrible it is for women outside of the U.S. and the situations they're living in around the world that are Christians. It's amazing. You know, uh, we're trying to figure out, you know, what, what we're going to buy for our next creature comfort, um, you know, how I'm going to spend my vacation time. Uh, these precious saints are living in these awful conditions like hell on earth with these demonic demonically wicked um, people that are just ruining their lives in these t terrible countries it's just it's it's awful um, and <clears throat> you know as a side note we are right now kind of at a crossroads in our own country right um, if you're a Christian, and again, I, this is not politics, and, and I'll, sh I'll show you why in a minute. If you're a Christian and you don't vote, you're asking to live like these people live in those countries. And that's not an extreme statement. Um, our country actually hangs in the balance because 40% of Christians, they found in the last few elections, don't vote. And 30% aren't even registered to vote. That's unbelievable. It's unconscionable. Uh, look, you, you want to see a biblical perspective on this. Paul used his position as a Roman citizen more than once to further the gospel in the book of Acts. It's not a political statement. God has put us here to have wisdom to use what's at our disposal to further the gospel. Um, there are pastors today that tell their congregations that they are not spiritual if they vote. And, you know, that getting into politics is somehow trusting the government. And uh, look, we have all these wicked people in politics because there's no good people in politics. They don't get involved. Christians are told that, oh, if you get in politics, that means you trust the government to change the world. No, no. It's, it's just that you enable the society that you live in to operate and function in a way where the gospel can be spread without hindrance. That's what it enables. This is ultimately for the gospel. Um, frankly, uh, pastors that tell their congregations that they do not know the Bible, that they are ignorant uh, of what the Bible teaches, if they're saying that to the congregations, and they've created an artificial spirituality and impose it on God's people, and it and it cripples the gospel. It cripples it. Hey, do a Google search. Search on North Korea at night, and you'll see it. North Korea is black. South Korea is all lit up. Why? What's the difference? 
because South Korea is free, all right? Their politics enables them to be free. They can preach the gospel there. Um, and, you know, you have some pretty large churches in South Korea. So, I mean, you have the gospel being spread and it's not hindered. You go into North Korea, you go to jail. Christians are hiding in North Korea. It's altogether different, okay? Because if the government is not influenced by the light of the gospel, then it will shut it down. Two seconds, because it doesn't want it. Um, now, do you think those women living in the Muslim countries that are being forced to these um, awful marriages, do you think um, they would choose to live in the country that they're living in under the conditions that they're living if they could vote and change it? Come on. Um, I mean, a lot of it is sex trafficking. This is awful that Christian women that have given their lives to Christ have to deal with this terrible, terrible situation. Um, and if we throw away in this country um, because of some false sense of spirituality, the, the, the right to, that we have right now to vote uh, and to exercise the constitutional values that are at least hanging by a thread right now, um, then we deserve to live in Korea, North Korea, not South Korea. And that's where we're going to end up. We're going to end up in a situation where we'll be oppressed and everybody will be complaining about how awful the government is when they never stepped out to try to change it. We have an opportunity to change things in, in a nonviolent way. You can go out and you can change it at the ballot box. You can vote people into office that have biblical views. Now, I'm not saying that a person has to be a Christian for you to vote for them, but let's face it. Um, I mean, if every Christian voted, then the baby killing, uh, the sex trafficking that's going on just astronomically now because of the open border and the, um, you know, the, uh, the organized uh, criminal activity on the border, uh, it's just, it's terrible. The growing violence in many cities um, now, a lot of the, the blue cities will come out and say, oh, our violence is down. It's not. It, it, the, the crime is down. It's not. Um, because what they're doing, I know. Uh, I live in a blue state. I know what it's like. Uh, what they do is they, they take a whole bunch of crimes and they say, well, those aren't crimes anymore. And then that, that alters the, uh, the percentage of criminal activity. Um, it, it's, it's dishonest. And it's it's a sham. It's a lie. Um, if you don't prosecute crime, you don't have it. Yep. No, no criminal behavior going on here. Meanwhile, it's all happening all around you. Uh, Boston's Mayor Wu is a leftist, right? Uh, she doesn't want to prosecute uh, 15 crimes that the former district attorney, Rachel Rollins, who also didn't want to prosecute any crimes, who went to... Um, you know, she went to the federal government. She got kind of promoted up there and was caught in some corruption and then they got rid of her. But anyways, um, so imagine in your town and in your state, if they didn't want to prosecute trespassing, shoplifting, including uh, offenses that are essentially shoplifting, but charged as larceny, larceny under $250, Disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace, um, receiving stolen property, minor driving offenses, including operating with a, sus uh, with a suspended or revoked license, um, breaking and entering, um, where it is into a vacant property or, or for the purpose of sleeping or see seeking refuge from the cold, and there's no actual damage to the property. So if they can get into your house criminals and say, well, I just wanted to come and get warm. You can't throw them out. This is insanity. Um, wanton or malicious destruction of property. They don't want to prosecute this. This is a list. This is a list that the Boston mayor said, no, we don't want to prosecute this. Threats, including domestic violence, minors in possession of alcohol, drug possession, drug possession with the intent to distribute, um, a standalone resisting 
arrest charge. In other words, cases where a person is charged with resisting arrest, uh, and that is the only charge. Well, if it's only resisting arrest and you're, you know, um, dealing with the cop and you say, you know, and then you run away or, you know, physically try to resist. Well, well, if that's the only charge, we're fine with that. This, this is crazy, I'm telling you. Um, resisting arrest charge combined with only charges that fall under the list of charges uh, that they decline to prostitute. In other words, resisting arrest charge combined with only a trespassing charge. You want to live in that neighborhood? I don't want to live in that neighborhood. I mean, come on. Um, so, look, if you're not registered to vote, register um, and vote biblically. What do I mean by that? One party is going to be more biblical than the other. You can argue about candidates all day long, but you're really voting a party and the certain policies that stand within that party. And if you can't figure out from Democrat and Republican which party is more biblical, then go ask a seven-year-old. You tell them what the policies are, and I bet you they'll figure it out real quick. Uh, immorality is very clearly the the kind of the standard of the leftist camp. Look, I know we don't uh, we're not supposed to trust in government to change the world. I agree. The government is not going to change the world. Jesus is going to come and put them all down. However, though government is not the solution to the world, God has given us governments. And from the Old Testament prophets to the New Testament apostles, they dealt with the governments to have some kind of influence to further the cause of God, whether Old Testament or New. Right? God's given us a responsible responsibility to promote morality. And immoral policies hurt people. Um, we can change that with a vote. Uh, immoral policies have enabled how many million babies to be murdered over the years f from the time of Roe versus Wade. And we look at that and we say, well, it was voting that, that enabled that. That's what happened. So, I mean, yeah, did the Supreme Court really blunder that? Yeah, we're not going to get into all that. But that's not the point. The point is voting can change things. And it did change things, and it can change things. It's not going to. It's not going to bring in the kingdom of God. Nothing's going to change the course of the plan of God. However, if you live in a place, a country, or if you live in a state that you can vote, and it can have an effective change in how you're governed, so that you can live godly, and you're not forced to do things that the Bible is telling you not to do then you need to express your right through that vote while you have that right before it's taken away. And believe me, uh, well, we're at an hour, but <clears throat> the next election, it's going to be a turning point in our nation. So um, anyways, that's not politics. That's morality. and That's biblical morality. Um, it's a responsibility we have as Christians. Imagine if all the Christians get out to vote, uh, we would almost control the platform. I mean, that's how many, that's how much we can influence it. I mean, think about it. 30% of Christians aren't registered to vote. Uh, honestly, shame on them. 40% don't vote. There's nothing spiritual about that at all. Anyways, um, we'll pick up on verse 13 next week. Um, well, actually, you know what? Let me rifle through that because it'll start our next section. So Peter says in verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Voting isn't going to bring that in, but Jesus will bring that in. So prophecy is effectively a promise. And it's promising what God is going to do or what's going to happen. Uh, anytime he says something's going to happen, that's his word. You can take it to the bank. And it really, it does. It constitutes a promise. Now, he promised, right? Um, we read it through Isaiah that he would create a new heavens and a new earth. 
Uh, obviously, he said he was doing it. He says, I create. And then we saw John in the future vision. He saw it actually happen. So when God gives us a promise, he then confirms it. And that's what he did with John's vision to encourage us that this is what's going to actually occur. It's not an empty promise. That's why it's important. The scriptures are not empty promises. And they're not open-ended predictions that just can be interpreted any way you want to. They are very specific, and many of them have already been fulfilled. I mean, like the example of Isaiah and then John seeing the result. But think about the predictions just for the first coming of Christ. Um, there were actually over 300, and um, so he fulfilled those in his first coming. Now, this secures the predictions of the second coming because though the false teachers will mock it and scorn it, um, when you when you have 100% with the number of prophecies that have been fulfilled so far, well, obviously, it's not going to, you know, it's, it's not going to put God in a position where it's like he may not be able to do it. Of course he's going to do it. That's why the Bible's written... Um, and the future is laid out in it because God has already seen it from his vantage point. So a new heavens and a new earth is all part of God's plan for the world. And it's going to happen after the thousand year reign. Uh, righteousness is going to dwell in it. Can't wait for that time. And it's a time that honestly we should be looking forward to. There'll be no more lies, no false teachers, no deception, no wickedness, no evil, no anti-Christian or anti-Christ sentiment. Um, all those that want nothing to do with God, nothing to do with Christ, they will be in outer darkness. Jesus said in John 3.19, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So they'll have all the darkness that they want. They love darkness. God's going to give them all the darkness they can handle. Uh, but it won't be comfortable because it's going to be eternal punishment. It's not going to be a party where, you know, all the unbelievers are going to be partying with their friends. It's not going to happen. Um, there's, no, there's no keg parties and dancing in hell. And it's out of darkness. It's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's eternal punishment. And... Those, those people will be isolated along with Satan and the angels that followed him. Uh, they will not interfere with the righteousness of God's kingdom that he has planned for us. And we need to look forward to that because it will be a very refreshing and restful time. We'll just be able to focus on the Lord and everything that he has for us and the inheritance that lies before us. So with that, We'll pick up on verse 14 next week. But until then, may God richly bless you as you continue to study his word.